There are not many men of whom you can say that they changed the course of history, but the man whose memory is being celebrated here today was certainly one of them. He landed here at Samsun on the Black Sea coast of Turkey on the 19th of May, 1919. His name was Mustafa Kemal, and he'd come to start a war of liberation. Within his lifetime, he became a legend. He was the hero of the defense of Gallipoli in the First World War, and after the war, it was his fierce inspiration that led the Turks to victory in their struggle for independence. Finally, he used his authority and his astonishing willpower to transform a backward, beaten empire into a republic with a new and secure identity. Autocratic by temperament, he fought all his life for the principles of democracy, and he won the affection and the loyalty of the simple, stubborn Turkish peasants. While he lived, they followed him without question, and before he died, they rewarded him with the title of Ataturk, the father of the Turks. Mustafa Kemal was born in 1881 in Salonika, now the second city of Greece, but at that time still part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. It was a cosmopolitan city where a quick-witted boy could learn much about the forces which were pulling the empire apart from within. And Mustafa Kemal was just such a boy, critical from the outset of the hidebound ways of the past, instinctively in tune with the progressive movements of thought taking shape around him. He came from a lower middle-class family who lived in this house overlooking the city. His father was a minor official, an ineffectual character who died while Mustafa Kemal was only a child. His mother was made of sterner stuff, but even she found him hard to handle. From the beginning, he was obstinate, always determined to get his own way. She was a pious Muslim, and he upset her by his refusal to accept an orthodox Muslim education. Nothing would satisfy him but to go to a military school, and for the next 30 years, the army was his life. He grew up in a society which was near the point of disintegration. At the end of the 19th century, the sprawling Ottoman Empire, whose dominions covered most of the Near East, part of North Africa, and reached up into Europe, was on the defensive. As the subject peoples of the Balkans struggled to throw off Turkish rule, the European powers watched for an opportunity to profit from the empire's decline. Eager to extend Germany's influence to the east, Kaiser Wilhelm was posing as Turkey's friend, and the Turkish army was being trained by German advisers. When the Kaiser paid a state visit to Constantinople, he was lavishly received by the Sultan. As he was welcomed by the Turks, the Kaiser must have wondered how long the Ottoman Empire would survive. For below the surface, discontent was rising in Turkey, discontent with a decadent, enfeebled bureaucracy which was presiding over the empire's decline. Mustafa Kemal became aware of this discontent when he entered the military academy in Constantinople, and he found himself at once in sympathy with it. He joined eagerly in the activities of a secret society, writing articles for its underground newspaper. Characteristically, he criticized his colleagues for being too moderate. With his forceful personality and his penetrating blue eyes, he insisted always that he knew best. His ideas must predominate. Even among his closest friends, the young officers who were to collaborate with him in the great days that lay ahead, Kemal's belief in his own destiny was something of a joke. One of them was Ali Fethi, whose son, Professor Osman Okya, tells the story of how a group of them sat one day in a cafe discussing the future. One wanted to become a minister of war, the other wanted to be a general, another wanted to be an ambassador, and uh, my father was among them uh, also. Finally, Ataturk had not st spoken up to that time, and somebody turned to him and asked him what he would like to be. And uh, he said, I'm going to be the one who's going to appoint you to the, all these posts in the future. And everybody started laughing. But his opportunity was not far off. When the First World War broke out and Turkey joined in at Germany's side, he begged to be given an active post. 
He was appointed to the command of a division under the German general Lehmann von Sanders. Its headquarters were to be at Gallipoli. At the beginning of 1915, there was a stalemate on the Western Front. Winston Churchill proposed a scheme for an expedition to capture Constantinople and open a back door into Central Europe. The approach to Constantinople lay through the narrow strait of the Dardanelles. The War Cabinet in London decided to launch a naval expedition to bombard and take the Gallipoli Peninsula. Lord Kitchener told the government, If the fleet gets through, Constantinople will fall of itself, and you will have won not a battle, but the war. The Dardanelles were guarded only by a series of ancient forts. But although a British fleet attacked in February and again in March, it was unable to get through. The task was too much for the Navy alone, and so an army was hastily gathered and sent out to reinforce it. The problem for the Turks was to know where to expect the Allied attack. To cover all eventualities, Lehman von Sanders had distributed his forces from north to south of the Straits. In the event, it was Mustafa Kemal's force which was to play the decisive role. For the British landed their main force on the west coast, opposite the place where his division was in reserve. Early on the morning of the 15th of April, 1915, reports began to come in of scattered landings at several points. Kemal led one battalion up towards the ridge of Chunuk Baya, from which he could look down to the beaches on the west coast. This was the decisive moment of the battle, and it was also a turning point in Mustafa Kemal's career. From the fighting that followed, he was to emerge as a national hero. This low hill dominates the peninsula. If the Allies could capture it, they would command the narrowest part of the Straits, and then nothing could prevent the British fleet from forcing the Dardanelles. Mustafa Kemal realized this and acted swiftly. And what he did that morning decided the outcome of the battle. His men were tired from their climb, and he left them to rest for a few minutes while he came on ahead with a party of officers to see how the battle was shaping. He was walking up this hill when he saw coming towards him a party of Turkish soldiers pursued by the advance guard of the Anzacs. He ordered them to stand and fight. And when they protested that they'd no more ammunition, he said, use your bayonets. Then he sent word for his main party to come up as fast as possible and ordered the men about him to lie down, facing the enemy with their bayonets fixed. To his relief, he saw that the Anzacs too hesitated and then they lay down. The advance was checked and Mustafa Kemal said afterwards, this was the moment of time that we gained. Taking advantage of it, he brought up his best regiment. Then, without waiting for orders, but trusting to his instinct that this was the key moment of the battle, he threw in all his reserves. During the fighting, Kemal was everywhere himself, inspiring his men with his own indomitable spirit. I don't order you to attack. I order you to die. In the time it takes us to die, other troops and other commanders can come and take our places. The Turkish soldiers died in their hundreds, but they held the ridge and the Allied attack was broken. The Anzac commander proposed an immediate evacuation, but the commander-in-chief, Sir Ian Hamilton, told him, You've only to dig, dig, dig, until you're safe. Better to die like heroes on the enemy's ground than be butchered like sheep on the beaches, like the runaway Persians at Marathon. Three months later, in August, Hamilton launched one more attack with fresh landings at Suvla Bay and a renewed assault on the ridge at Chunuk Baya. This time, the Anzacs won the ridge and held it for two days. The Turks were discouraged and exhausted, but Kemal urged an immediate counterattack. This is our only chance. If we lose it, we may well be faced with total disaster. Lehman von Sanders agreed with him. That evening I gave command of all the troops in the section to Colonel Mustafa Kemal. He was a leader that delighted in responsibility. I had full confidence in his energy. Again, the moment was critical, and the situation that faced him was a daunting one. It was not easy to shoulder such a responsibility, but as I had decided not to survive my country's destruction, I accepted it proudly. Once again, his energy and assurance rallied the Turks for a supreme effort. 
After a night of hurried preparations, Kemal led a dawn attack on Chinook Bayer, overwhelming the Allied line and driving the British off the ridge. This time, the Turkish victory was decisive and Hamilton cabled to London that the Gallipoli campaign was lost. A few months later, the Allies evacuated the peninsula. The British official historian later observed of Kemal, Seldom in history can the exertions of a single divisional commander have exercised so profound an influence. Not only on the course of a battle, but perhaps on the fate of a campaign and even the destiny of a nation. For Kemal, this was a turning point. His success at Gallipoli justified the belief he'd always had in his own capacity for leadership, and the remaining years of the war reinforced his reputation. Now he had the authority he needed to build a new Turkey out of the debris of the Ottoman Empire. During these years, one of his closest associates was Ismet İnönü, who was later to be his prime minister. Atatürk'te okuldan yakın sınıflardayız. Orada da birbirimize yakın rütbelerde bulunduk. Atatürk and I were contemporaries at school and we held similar rank in the army. His ambition was clear right from the start. Later, he showed an unexpected skill on the battlefield. In conditions of increased difficulty, he displayed one by one all the qualities of a great commander, emerging with honor when the armistice was concluded. There was soon no doubt that the empire was doomed. So Ataturk made up his mind that it was no longer possible to work with the Sultan's government. Kemal's thoughts at once turned to some form of resistance movement. At his house in Constantinople, he gathered round him others who shared his ideas. Their aim was to stir the Turkish nation, defeated and leaderless, to rise against its powerful enemies. It was the greed of the Allies, Britain, France, Italy and Greece, that gave Kemal his chance of success. They'd already seized the Arab provinces of the Turkish Empire, and now they planned to divide among themselves the richer parts of Turkey itself. As part of this policy, Lloyd George encouraged the Greek government to land 20,000 troops at Smyrna, on the western coast of Turkey. It was May the 15th, 1919. This was the critical moment, as Mustafa Kemal saw. By that time, the foundations of the Ottoman Empire had collapsed. All that remained was the homeland where a handful of Turks had found refuge. The last question revolved around the partition of this remnant. There was only one decision possible in the circumstances. It was to create a new Turkish state, unconditionally independent and based on national sovereignty. The effect of the Greek landing is recalled by Professor Arnold Toynbee, who was in Turkey during the War of Independence. It had an electric effect, I think. Uh, there was. A, a massacre, well, several hundred people, I think, when the Greek forces landed, they were, lost their heads. And, and anyway, the uh, invasion of uh, the heartland of uh, Turkey itself, they were reconciled to the loss of the Arab provinces. They had already lost the Balkan provinces. But uh, this made Ataturk's point that uh, the Turkish nation was the thing they must save, and the Turkish nation was in danger of extinction. Uh, if it had been designed to... Uh, Make it look when it could be done better. <laughs> now Kemal had an unexpected stroke of luck. In Constantinople, the Allies had grown uneasy. There was unrest in the provinces, and they urged the Sultan's government to restore order. Kemal was appointed inspector of the army in a large area of Anatolia, the Turkish heartland. His orders were to put a stop to illegal activities, but there were other ideas in his mind. When he sailed from Constantinople, he was determined to use his powers to raise a revolt in Anatolia. I felt as if a cage had been opened, and as if I were a bird ready to open my wings and fly through the sky. On May the 19th, 1919, he landed here at Samsun on the Black Sea coast. In later years, when people asked him when his birthday was, Mustafa Kemal liked to say it was May the 19th, because this was the day when he started on his real life's work. 
on the work he'd been half-consciously preparing himself for all those years. For Turkey, too, it marked a new beginning. And as we've seen, the Turks still celebrate May the 19th as the starting point of their War of Independence. For what Mustafa Kemal did when he landed here was at once to get in touch with army commanders and local government officials. But instead of carrying out the orders given to him in Constantinople, he did the exact opposite. He set on foot a popular resistance movement whose aim was to unite Turkey and to drive all foreign occupation forces out of the country. After a week, he moved inland to Amasya, a little town dramatically situated in a gorge in the mountains beneath its ruined citadel. Here, he would be safer from pursuit, for by now the government was well aware of its mistake in letting him go and was pressing for his recall. Ignoring the orders from Constantinople, he appealed openly to the people of Amasya to join his new resistance movement. Citizens of Amasya, if the enemy tries to land in Samsun, we must pull on our peasant shoes, we must withdraw to the mountains, we must defend the country to the last rock. If it is the will of God that we be defeated, we must set fire to all our homes, to all our property. We must lay the country in ruins and leave it an empty desert. Here he summoned his most trusted associates to meet him and make plans for the future. The central government is under foreign dominion. The Turkish nation is determined to end its domination. We must therefore call a representative congress at Sivas. Sivas was a central rallying point, but communications were primitive. There was no railway, and the delegates who joined Kemal here had to travel great distances by carriage or on horseback over the rough Anatolian roads. In this ancient town, amongst the monuments of Turkey's Seljuk past, the delegates met to give formal sanction to the movement of popular resistance. The Congress took place in a secondary school on the 4th of September, 1919. After electing Mustafa Kemal as their chairman, they approved the terms of a historic national pact. The pact insisted on the right of self-determination for the Turks within their national homeland and the rejection of all forms of foreign interference or occupation. Then, on Kemal's initiative, they broke off relations with the government of the Sultan. Now there was no going back, but the task ahead looked almost impossible. With only a handful of delegates behind him, Kemal had to revitalize a country broken and impoverished. He had no machinery of government, no financial resources, no diplomatic recognition, while against him was the legitimate government of Turkey under the domination of the Allied powers. His answer was to defy the Allies by summoning a rebel parliament to meet in Angora, now known by its Turkish name, Ankara. Angora was little more than a fortified village, but it was far removed from the decadent atmosphere of Constantinople and from the threat of foreign domination, and it had the advantage of being on a railway. Many of those in Constantinople who sympathized with the revolution managed to slip away and join the rebels in Angora. On the 23rd of April, 1920, 369 members filed into a hastily converted parliament building. Now began a legendary period in which a popular government established itself in the face of every kind of obstacle, while Mustafa Kemal urged and goaded and persuaded and, if need be, forced its members to fight for Turkish independence. What we want to do in our situation is explainable neither in military nor in any other terms. But in spite of everything, we are going to do it. To save our country. To establish a free and civilized Turkish state. To live like human beings. While Kemal was fighting his battles in Parliament, the Sultan signed with the Allies the Treaty of Sevres, confirming the dismemberment of Turkey. To enforce their will, the Allies, encouraged by Lloyd George, sanctioned a Greek advance into Anatolia itself. It proved a disastrous mistake, for it was here, among the simple peasant farmers of central Turkey, that Kemal's strongest support lay. As Winston Churchill wrote, Worn down by long, disastrous wars, his empire falling to pieces around him, the Turk was still alive. In his breast was beating the heart of a race that had challenged the world, and for centuries had contended victoriously against all comers. 
the Greeks occupied Brusa and moved forward to Eskishahir and Afyon to control the vital railway line to Angora. Twice at the small village of Inanu, the Turks broke their attack and forced the Greeks back on Brusa. Professor Toynbee accompanied the Greek expedition as a journalist and he recalls the contrast between the two armies. The Turkish dead were peasants, just in civilian costume, peasant costume, uh, with uh, rifles. The Greek dead uh, were in uniform, of course, and he uh, heavily equipped by the Allies. Um, the uh, Turkish cavalry were in uniform, but uh, uh, I think the whole thing was a great surprise uh, to the, the Greeks, the Turks themselves, above all, and to the uh, British. And uh, I also think it had a tremendous psychological effect. It was uh, at Turk's first instalment, I can uh, save Turkey, and here I'm doing it. But in June 1921, the Greeks came on again, with an army reinforced to over 100,000 men, well equipped and even supported by a small air force. This time they captured Afyon and Eskishahir and came within striking distance of Angora itself. Kemal studied the Turkish defences and at once ordered a general retreat. It was an alarming decision, but Kemal saw there was no choice as his army had little equipment and no reserves. Now followed the most desperate phase of the War of Independence. Armed with special powers from the Assembly, Kemal called for a tremendous effort of national mobilisation. The response was immediate and spontaneous. From all over Anatolia, the peasants came forward in their thousands. To meet the desperate shortage of equipment, workshops were improvised and blacksmiths were set to work making weapons. Even the Turkish women, emerging from centuries of seclusion, helped to carry ammunition to the front line and a primitive supply system was organized. By the time the Greeks resumed their attack, the Turkish defenses were far better organized. The Greeks had involved themselves in a situation where anything short of decisive victory was defeat. And the Turks were in a position where anything short of overwhelming defeat was victory. No aspect of this was hidden from the warrior chief who led the Turks. The threat to Angora was now acute. The Greeks were only 30 miles from the capital, and Kamal told his troops... There is no defence line, but a defence area. It is the area of the whole country. No part of it can be abandoned until it is soaked with the blood of our countrymen. They must resist to the end in the positions they hold. The Greek commanders, too, urged their men on to one final effort. They tell us that Angora is behind every mountain we attack, but 16 days have passed, no Angora. They tell us that if we fall into the hands of the Turks, we'll be killed, and they drive us on with machine guns. It was here, on the banks of the Sakaria River, that the Greek advance was finally thrown back. The Turks had established a good defensive position, protected in front by the river, and with a low line of hills running behind them. They were outnumbered by something like three to one, and the Greeks had more artillery. But once again, Mustafa Kemal had managed to inspire his men with something of his own indomitable spirit. And the Greeks, fighting far from their base, had difficulty in the heat of the summer in bringing up supplies and reinforcements as they needed them. If the Greeks succeeded in crossing the river and turning this position, then the road to Angora would be open to them. Several times they managed to penetrate the Turkish lines. But each time, Mustafa Kemal, in spite of the fact that on the eve of the battle he'd fallen from his horse and broken a rib, managed to rally his men. He seemed to carry the whole battle plan in his head, and as the Greeks threw in one attack after another, he fought them from hill to hill, and each time drove them back. For three weeks, the battle swung to and fro, until at last the Greek commander, seeing that his men were exhausted, and with the supply lines now being threatened by Turkish irregulars, called for a retreat, leaving the Turks masters of the battlefield. The threat to Angora had finally been lifted. The sense of relief in Angora was overwhelming.
Now all that remained was to drive the occupation force out of Turkey altogether. It took the Turks a year to build up their strength and then Kemal launched his final attack. Soldiers, your goal is the Mediterranean! The attack took the Greeks by surprise, and almost at once they were in headlong retreat. Tragically, the Greeks, seeing that all was lost, devastated the countryside as they fell back, burning villages and blowing up lines of communication behind them. An eyewitness described the scenes as the Greeks fell back. They went to pieces altogether. It was a sickening record of bestiality and barbarity. There was little to choose between the two races, Greek and Turk. Permeating the atmosphere as the Turks advanced down the valleys was the stench of unburied bodies, of charred human and animal flesh. It was all over in 15 days. Halide Adib, a remarkable woman journalist who had accompanied the advance, saw the Turkish cavalry entering Smyrna. In a single lightning flash, two long lines of horsemen drew their swords, and the sun gleamed on their steel as they galloped past us on either side. This time, the Turkish victory was complete. Here in Smyrna, on September the 10th, 1922, just three years after the Greeks had landed their army of occupation, Mustafa Kemal was able to realize his vision of a Turkey genuinely independent free at last from foreign occupation. But he knew that the victory was not his alone, and he paid tribute to the peasant soldier who had fought at his side, whom he called affectionately Little Mehmet. The greatest monument is Mehmetjik himself. It is thanks to him that these lands have remained within Turkish frontiers. Three days later, fire broke out in the Armenian sector of the town. And from the Allied warships in the bay, the sailors watched in horror as it spread through the city. The surface of the sea shone like burning copper. Twenty distinct volcanoes of raging flame were throwing up jagged, writhing tongues to a height of a hundred feet. The towers of the Greek churches, the domes of the mosques, the flat roofs of the houses were silhouetted against a curtain of flame. The warships took on board as many of the terrified, homeless refugees as they could manage. No one knows how the fire started or how many people died before the flames subsided, leaving the city an empty shell. The Greek adventure had ended in disaster, and with the Greeks out of the way, the rest of the Allied powers came to terms with this obstinate Turkey they had failed to subdue. The Treaty of Lausanne recognized the boundaries of the new Turkish state, and the last foreign troops were withdrawn from Turkish soil. Lloyd George resigned, and the last Ottoman Sultan left Constantinople in a British ship. The War of Independence was over, and the Turkish Republic was proclaimed on October the 29th, 1923, with Mustafa Kemal as its first president. He was now 42, with his real life's work, the modernization of Turkey, still ahead of him. In tackling it, he found for a short time an unfamiliar ally. In Smyrna, he had met and married a young woman named Latifa. Until now, he'd used women merely for amusement in his times of relaxation. But Latifa was different. Now he had a wife who seemed to embody all that he wanted for the new Turkey. She was intelligent and emancipated, and when she travelled with him through the country, he was proud to present her, unveiled, as a symbol of the future. In his house in Angora, Latifa tried to soften the harsh bachelor atmosphere to which he'd been accustomed. To find relief from his responsibilities, Kemal had indulged in long drinking bouts with his friends. Now he delighted in Latifa's company and found her support invaluable. And certainly he needed both, for the social revolution he was planning was to bring him into conflict with all the latent forces of reaction in a country still deeply conservative in its outlook. Only his strength of will could drag Turkey into the 20th century. Professor Toynbee remembers his first impression of Kemal. His whole personality was very forbidding. Um, when he talked to you, before he uttered, uttered uh, his forehead came down a sort of frown uh, down to his uh, eyebrows. And this was very intimidating. 
Uh, I got an impression of uh, tremendous uh, intellectual ability, great self-confidence, probably when once he made up his mind, pig-headedness. His first target was Islam and the hold it maintained on every aspect of Turkish life. Up till now, the holy law of Islam, a legacy from the Middle Ages, had governed the lives of the people. Its symbol was the caliph, the guardian of their faith, who was the ultimate authority in the field of education, law and social custom. Kemal abolished the caliphate and in 1926 introduced a civil code. Among other things, this transformed the whole status of Turkish women, who had played such an important part in the War of Independence, as Turkey's first woman lawyer, Soraya Aulu, recalls. Uh, during the independence war, Turkish women worked very hard to help to the Turkish army, carrying their ammunition, looking after the wounded uh, soldiers, and especially fighting besides this, uh, their brothers, fathers and sons. Uh, some of them even were killed during the war. This was tremendously significant. For until then, the position of women in Turkey had hardly altered since the days of the Prophet. Veiled and secluded, deprived of education and of any social contact outside the limits of the family, they could play no part in the wider life of the community. Now, both by legislation and by social change, he tried to bring Turkish women out of their seclusion, urging them to abandon the veil, winning them the right to education and eventually to vote alongside their husbands. If henceforward the women do not share in the social life of the nation, we shall never attain to our full development. We shall remain irremediably backward, incapable of treating on equal terms with the civilizations of the West. It was a paradox that Kemal's own emancipated wife was not with him to witness these changes. For all his progressive ideas about a woman's place in society, Kemal couldn't make his own marriage work. A wife with ideas of her own upset the pattern of his household. The habits of the barrack room were too deeply ingrained, and he found it intolerable that she should try to check his drinking, should object to his choice of friends, both men and women, and criticise him in front of others. In 1925, after only two years of marriage, he divorced her. I think if his wife was a little more tolerant, it would go on. But as she was in love with him, she couldn't be as tolerant as we are expecting. Otherwise, it would go on well. And she was very young. If she was a little elder, perhaps she would be, would understand also that Atatürk had some kind of customs that it wasn't very easy to change in a short time. With those who opposed his reforms, Kemal was both persuasive and dictatorial, as Halide Adib remembers. He was by turns cynical, suspicious, unscrupulous, and satanically shrewd. He bullied, he indulged in cheap street corner heroics. Of course, one knew all the time that there were men around him who were greatly his superior in intellect and far above him in culture and education. But though he excelled them in neither refinement nor originality, not one of them could possibly cope with his vitality. And it was this alone that made him the dominant figure. His personal authority was enormous, based as it was on his prestige as the liberator of his country. But now that the national emergency was passed, those who had helped him to victory came increasingly to resent his dictatorial methods. The strength was his strength of will, his power of uh, uh, persuading or inspiring people to do the impossible. But uh, this went along with, I must be the man to do it all. And uh, um, he was pretty cold-blooded. As long as he desperately needed them, and he did need this handful of able men and women he had around him at Ankara, uh, as long as he needed them before the war with the Greeks was won, he didn't break with them. But the moment uh, the war was won and uh, the pressure was off him, then he turned on them and turned them out, made it impossible for them to stay in Turkey, or really exile them. Uh, this, I think, was a pretty mean and black mark. Despite the opposition of his friends, Kemal pressed on with a program of reforms which covered every aspect of Turkish life. Some of his reforms were apparently trivial, like the abolition of the Fez. 
But the fez, the traditional headgear of the Turkish Muslim, was the symbol of everything that Kemal wanted to do away with. Deliberately, he went out into a particularly conservative area wearing a hat and insisting that those with him did the same. His object was to turn Turkey's face away from the east and towards the west. This grotesque mixture of styles is neither national nor international. A civilized international dress is worthy and appropriate for our nation, and we will wear it. Boots or shoes on our feet, trousers on our legs, shirt and tie, jacket and waistcoat, and of course, to complete these on our head, a cover with a brim. I want to make this clear. This head covering is called hat. His most ambitious reform altered the whole basis of Turkish education. The Arabic lettering in which every book in the country was written was abandoned in favor of a modified Latin script. Our rich and harmonious language will now be able to display itself with new Turkish letters. We must free ourselves from these incomprehensible signs that for centuries have held our minds in an iron vice. He himself travelled long distances out into the countryside with blackboard and chalk to teach the nation how to read and write. Kemal's objective was not only to educate, but to open a channel of communication with the West. With the same idea, he ordered the adoption of surnames, which until then were unknown in Turkey, and himself took the name of Ataturk, meaning father of the Turks. A new national pride was developing and towns which had been called by European names, like Angora and Constantinople, were now universally known by their Turkish names, Ankara and Istanbul. In everything, Ataturk took the lead himself, building railways, encouraging industry, planning factories, demonstrating new methods of agriculture. In the short space of six years, he had turned the structure of the state upside down. It had almost been too much for the patient Turkish people, and now the strain began to tell on Kemal himself. By the mid-thirties, his powers were failing. Years of hard drinking and the incessant demands he'd made on his own energies had undermined his health. The last phase was in many ways a sad one. In the midst of all his astonishing achievements, Kemal was cut off by his very nature from the sort of personal relationships that could have tempered his loneliness. Atatürk was a real human person. He was very sentimental in many ways. Atatürk had two kinds of character. He could be very firm and he could be very quiet and calm. Uh, you can you could you could see tears in his eyes. He loved children. He loved nature. He loved music. He loved his own nation. He loved his own country. Even I can say that he loved the whole world, and that's why he always wanted to have the peace, not the war in the whole world. Uh, At Duke, by all means, was a great man in many ways and that's why he was lonely by his sentimentality if he had uh, kept the able people around him who uh, helped him to win the war against the greeks and win the peace with the allies and if he had taken 12 years instead of six years to carry out his reforms i think those two things together would have made a very great difference to the future of turkey she would have had a happier last half century than she has had um, I don't know whether he knew he was going to have a shortish life. He was, uh, must have known he was an intelligent man. He was a very heavy drinker. And so he, he also felt that he had no time to lose. He must just press forward. But yet he had a kind of anticlimax of about 10 years, hadn't he, before his death, in which uh, the reforms were already uh, done, as much as Turkey could stomach for ever so long. And uh, he could have taken more time, as it turned out. But his temperament didn't allow him to do that. In the summer of 1938, during a holiday on the Bosphorus, he was taken seriously ill. He was carried to Istanbul to the old Sultan's palace of Dolma Bahçe, the symbol of the imperial past on which he had stamped his vision of a new Turkey. As part of this vision, he'd established his country's place in the world, steering it wisely between the two perils of Nazism and communism, cementing its relations with the democracies of the West.
Even now, his work done, he found it hard to give up, but he could feel power slipping from his grasp. His doctors had diagnosed cirrhosis of the liver, and his strength was ebbing away. Soon after nine o'clock, on the morning of the 10th of November, 1938, he died, and his secretary, Hassan Riza, murmured, Look, a piece of history is passing away. For Ataturk himself, the clock at last had stopped, but the train of events that he'd set in motion went on in the life of a country to which he'd given a new destiny. Few men have seen so many of their dreams come true as Ataturk. Looking out over this modern capital of Ankara, it's hard to imagine that 50 years ago there was just a village here, round the old citadel and nothing else. Ankara is Ataturk's creation, but then so is modern Turkey. There's hardly an institution in the country that doesn't bear his stamp, over whose birth he didn't personally preside. The form of government, the laws, the social system, the alphabet, even the frontiers of the country, they were all decided along the lines he proposed, and after he'd used his own extraordinary blend of force and persuasion to win acceptance for them. It was an astonishing achievement, especially when you remember the terrible plight of Turkey when he came on the scene. By his vision and his resolution, Mustafa Kemal built this nation. And if he was always ready to pay tribute to the courage and the steadfastness of the Turkish peasant, in that long war of liberation, the Turks in turn still honor him as Ataturk, the father of the Turks. <laughs>